Welcome to World Chefs podcast. I'm your host Ragnar Fredriksson and you're listening to World on a Plate. Welcome to this very first episode of 2023. So a happy new year to you all. And hey, we're going to just kick off the year with a, with a subject that I think uh, at this time of year, uh, probably many of us made a good resolution of, of a healthier diet and healthier lifestyle for, for the year to come. And uh, hey, I know it's not easy for sometimes it's a promise we make ourselves on New Year's and uh, and by the time we're in the middle of January, we're just back on the old track. And and so uh, maybe it's not such a, an easy thing. And there are there are there are probably a reason that lie behind it, that we fall into the same traps. And uh, and so uh, I wanted to touch base on on uh, uh, precisely that is uh, uh, eating disorders. Eating disorders, uh, we know in our industry, uh, is uh, our, our lifestyle do not always go with healthy lifestyle and healthy eating, although we, we, we work with food every day. And uh, I just want to sort of uh, yeah, uh, bring attention to the subject uh, here at the World Chefs. And so for that, I have a, an expert on the topic, which is uh, I have Dr. Eva Trujillo from Mexico. She's with me today. Uh, hello, Eva. Welcome on the show. Thank you, Ragnar. Very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. No, I thank you very much for accepting because uh, you know this. This uh, these are the type of topics that uh, that we don't often touch uh, touch on so much. You know, we we love talking about food, our our uh, our our creativity, uh, the pleasure, uh, but there are other parts of working in an industry. And uh, you know, when we talk about uh, mental health and uh, all sort of addiction and and uh, whether it's uh, you know hard hard drugs or, or alcoholism and and uh, and and a lot of uh, you know, depression there is a lot of work a uh, work uh, uh, especially around the holiday season there's a lot of work pressure on 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 uh, on the people in our industry probably right now more than ever you know since covid everybody was off uh, staying at home and then just there was a big boom in our industry where uh, everybody in the world wanted to go uh, uh, on a trip, on, on a trip to a restaurant, enjoy what they've been pride for two years, uh, which is a great problem to have uh, when you're a restaurant owner. But in the meantime, uh, restaurant lost a lot of manpower. So, it, like the difficulty now is to have enough manpower to staff the restaurants, which makes a huge pressure on everybody in the industry. And and so uh, you know, back to to your your subject. Sometimes uh, that 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 sort of pressure relates to other problems with addiction and and. And and so uh, in your specific uh, expert uh, 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 matter, it would be the the, uh, the the eating disorder. Maybe maybe just to start off, uh, Eva. Maybe uh, just to give you a little bit of background of yourself. Would you mind just tell us the tell the audience sort of what what is your uh, background in the in the subject? Yes, for sure. Um, I'm an eating disorder specialist. I have been in this field for almost uh 25 years and i am i am i work and i live in mexico in monterrey mexico and i'm past president of the academy for eating disorders and from many eating disorders organizations like the mexican association of eating disorders there are some colleges about eating disorders and i had uh, i have had the privilege to found or to direct, to chair many eating disorders organizations, not only in Mexico, but in Latin America. Um, um, my background, I, I am an MD, medical doctor. I'm actually, I'm a pediatrician, but I left basically that field and started the eating disorder field 25 years ago. Right, right. So, uh, so uh, a lo long, long uh, experience of working on the subject, uh, and you know, uh, when we first spoke, of course, you know, I guess there's a uh, people might not always recognize themselves in in the uh, this situation. Uh, maybe good for to have maybe what, what is a definition of of eating disorder? How do you, how do you recognize it? And, and what are the different forms of, of eating disorders and how it sort of comes across? Yeah. Okay, uh, that is a very interesting question, Ragnar. I would like to start by defining in the spectrum of eating uh we have the people who it's uh what we call normal okay and then we have the people who has, who has a disorder eating and then finally we have people who develop an eating disorder 
um, people who has a um, disorder eating may be very normalized in our social uh, society, but there's some some people who develop a lot of symptoms that may mimic an eating disorder. And even if they don't have the full blown syndrome or the full criteria, they can be benefited by treatment just as if they have an eating disorder, okay? So what is an eating disorder? They are serious brain-based disorders with significant medical and psychiatric morbidity and mortality. And the anorexia nervosa is the second highest uh, psychiatric disorder um, in death rates, just preceded by opioid uh, addictions. Um, but people have to know that eating disorders are treatable and full recovery is always possible. And they affect any age, any gender, any race, any abilities and socioeconomic status, and also any weight or uh, body shape. So one of the big myths about eating disorders is that people believe that you have to be very, very underweight or very high in a very high way to develop an eating disorder. And that is not true. You can have an eating disorder in any way. And uh, the vast majority of those with eating disorders are not visibly emaciated as we usually think about them. Okay, so I think those are very important issues we uh, uh, people should know about about eating disorders. Um, all healthcare providers should work to mitigate the the risk of missing an eating disorder when a patient presents who does not confirm this stereotype of someone with an eating disorder. So uh, it's very important that as professionals we always ask. And when we talk about the the food industry or the chef, uh, or the the world chef. I um, I actually for this interview, I looked for some uh statistics, and I really didn't find something as specific. But I found something a report from twenty twenty one from an organization called Nine to Five, and they were reporting that in a, a, a survey that they did to six hundred seventy three professionals in the food industry. 63% of them had an, had symptoms of an eating disorder. So uh, right. it's very prevalent. Working in the food service industry can be very rewarding. I have no doubts about it, but it is vital of those who are recovering from eating disorders to evaluate if it will be contributing to or detracting from their recovery because individuals with eating disorders can develop an obsession with food including meal preparation and cooking for others. And even many people pursue on their career in the culinary arts due to this obsession in food. Mm -hmm. So some may develop an eating disorder while working in this food industry. Another uh, will say that they their eating disorder did not originate in this industry, but definitely working in this industry might pick their symptoms in eating disorders. So it's very important um, for whoever is um, uh, in, in this in this area and 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 discovers or um, get awareness about these symptoms to uh, look for help to uh, that they that they know that it it it's possible to be in recovery and working in this field. They just, they need to learn coping skills and the tools to handle any sort of triggers that may come in their way while working in this field. For example, I guess that, um, and as you were saying, no uh, um, high paced job can lead to a lot of stress, which can cause uh, people to use food to uh, as a coping mechanism. So I think that is uh, important to be aware, aware about it. Um, also um, the, the structure in, in meals for people who is in the food industry is uh, usually as, as, uh, as an external person from this in industry, I bet it is very chaotic. I mean, they have very short breaks. They sometimes they may not be able to sit on the table to eat or, or to have a snack. 
uh, which can lead to be grabbing food all the time and because it's easier and it's, it's more handy. So that may trigger um, symptoms about eating disorders. And also, for, of course, the constant exposure to food, um, which can make them engage in unhealthy behaviors such as binging or purging or restricting, which are the three major behaviors that we can find in eating disorders. Um, also, uh, talking all day about food and being related to food all day and about the nutritional value of food can make people either to eat more or binge or to restrict a lot of, about food when they have issues about how they feel with food, about their emotions around food. So um, it's very important that a uh, somebody who is uh, suspects that they are having issues with food and about how they relate to their body to look for help and to know that recovery is possible. Actually, I have had patients who are chef in my in my office and we have uh, work about coping skills to deal uh the the people i can remember at this moment that i had treated uh they had a binge eating disorder uh, which is very prevalent in um in the food industry and in in the in latin america and uh, we have uh we have uh teach them coping skills to to uh uh to be able to sort all the triggers that they have in the daily basis in their work and at home. And um, so my major uh, message to whoever is hearing me is recovery is possible. It's, they are treatable and you can do it. It's actually amazing what you say, like uh, over 60% uh, are concerned of people in our industry. So. So more than half, it's uh, it's a lot more uh, common than than uh, we would have thought, and probably we never think about these subjects. Uh, so, so tell me, you mentioned uh, triggers. So, so what what are typically the the triggers? Uh, to just go into so, details. Probably, if somebody is um is suffering about um, uh, a very disordered eating or an eating disorder, they should think about it when they are obsessionally or very obsessed about food while they are at work. Um, if they perch or uh, binge uh, while they are in their breaks or during work, if uh, they are continually judging themselves or comparing themselves to other people about what they are eating or how they, how they look, um, if they start for example, counting calories in their head while they are working with food. If they if they are aware, they use food as a stress reliever. Uh, for example, when they get home after a very, very hard day and they see themselves just eating, not with not hunger, but just eating to comfort. Mm. Or if um, they see that they cannot sit down to eat and they are grabbing food all the time just to uh, comfort it without listening to their signals of hunger and society. Or if they feel overwhelmed with feelings of guilt after eating any meal, any snack, I think those are uh, major triggers that should be uh, an, a red flag for anyone who is in this industry and maybe feeling different or maybe feeling um, um, uh, overwhelmed uh, with the food and the environment. Right. So, I mean, would it... Um... Would, would would people uh, recognize themselves quite easily that like people would uh, realize themselves they they have a de eating disorder or is it something that you know uh, you, we should be looking in uh, from uh, like from our colleagues should we be looking after our colleagues can we detect uh, i mean does it work like that that you know can you just tell somebody that is working with you as a manager or what should i say like listen, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm observing you, and uh, I think you might have an eating disorder, and you should look for help. Like, is that a positive way, or would it maybe like backtrack and say like uh, go people go into denial, or what is your experience with that? No, 
you are a very good point. Um, eating disorders can be very secretive and mm. people may not be aware they have an eating disorder or if they are aware, they are aware they may not be uh, ready to open it to everyone. Mm. And because in our society, disorder eating is kind is kind of normative you know it's a in some uh in some social circles it's normal not to eat or it it, it is even normal to eat a lot right so uh all these are uh, chaotic uh um, patterns of eating and um and restricted uh, restricted behaviors or even binge and purging behaviors are um are not um, uh, great. Uh, are not seen as very bad in some social circles. You know, I even had patients who told me that in their so in their social circle is is normal not to eat, but abnormal if you eat in in social reunions you know so is they are very very secretive and people may think that whatever they are doing is not that bad unfortunately in the eating disorder field is very very common that people if they are not in the streams of weight in, in the in the stream in, in the in this uh, range in this spectrum if they are not in in either very very underweight or very very high weight uh, it doesn't uh starts a, a red flag because people doesn't think they have an an a, a problem that's why i started saying that it's very important that people know that eating disorders can present in any weight any body shape and you don't have to be very underweight or very high weight to uh, suspect to have an eating disorder mm. um uh, also um uh, people has to remember that uh, they can be um related to very serious medical complications and even professionals, uh, medical professionals can confuse the symptoms. And this is like, what was first, the egg or the hen? Because mm -hmm. it's the, the medical complications is, is, um, is very common that they uh, confuse as, as something that is causing the eating disorder instead of the other way that the eating disorder is causing this medical complication. So uh, these are disorders that are sometimes are very difficult to identify even for seasoned professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the best thing is that people get informed, that people can know what is uh, what are the symptoms to what a what uh, they can expect. And basically, from my point of view, when you think about uh, feeding and eating, you can think about a social area as an emotional area and a physical area, you know? And they should be in a strict balance. When you lose any kind of that balance, you can say you you started with a disorder eating. What I, I'm trying to, to say with this is, if you if you physically uh, food may be rewarding to feel healthy to feel good to have a good uh, mood to be uh, active to be socially integrated and when food instead of doing that is doing that you feel awkward that you isolate from others that you are unstable in your mood that you had physical uh, complications like feeling fatigue or poor concentration or you are irritable or you are moody, uh, then probably you are having a problem with the way you are eating and, and then the, the uh, nutrition you are getting. And probably that can be the start point for a disorder eating that later if you're vulnerable you can develop an eating disorder. Right. So these are all the symptoms. That, and as you said, they can actually, they can be a symptom for so many things and unnecessarily uh, 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 outside external people would, uh, would detect uh, uh, and link it to the eating disorder. I guess it's a very, a very private, Definitely. A very private thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so I, and I and I like just to to uh, like to to look into how like uh, how how one can get help and how it is treated. I guess it's very different from the type of eating disorder you have. Whether it's a uh, you mentioned, you know, is is it uh, binging or is it restricting? Would would that be the same psychological sort of uh, uh, help that people get? And then like and I guess also like, these are the extreme. I'm, I'm guessing now. But there is like what I'm learning from you now is that is the, all that in between where it's not so physically visible, but it's more a, an emotional charge that you know it's, and and so uh, would it that that be a very different uh, uh, treatment? If I say treatment or or a, would you call it well, a, uh, would you call it a therapy or? Yes, but to start treatment, I think that the the very first step is to get a diagnosis. That's the the first step towards recovery from an eating disorder, and treating an eating disorder generally involves a combination of psychological, medical, and nutritional counseling, along with the psychiatric and, of course, the medical monitoring. So treatment must address the eating disorder symptoms, especially restricting purging or binging, and all the medical consequences, as well as psychological, biological, interpersonal, cultural forces that contribute to or maintain the eating disorder, okay? So in, in the eating disorder field, we have levels of care, and eating disorders can be delivered in a very big variety of settings. We have the outpatient setting, then we have the partial programs or partial partial hospitalizations programs. Then we have inpatient uh, settings and residential treatment settings. So it would depend on uh, the, the specific characteristics of the person who is suffering from an eating disorder, the type, the level of care they need, and then to start the treatment. You know, um, there are a variety of treatments uh, that have been shown to be effective in treating eating disorders. One of the big mantras in the eating disorder field is that we need to do um, a very um, opportune, um, um, a very, um, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. uh, I'm thinking in Spanish. Uh, uh, a prompt diagnosis, the, the, the sooner the better to start treatment, because the sooner we start treatment, the better outcome we can give for the patient. Um, generally, treatment is more effective before the disorder becomes chronic. But even people with long-standing eating disorders can and do recover. So we need to remember that. Um, um, when they ask me, when is the best time to treat an eating disorder? I say, as soon as you diagnose it. So, and, and as I was telling you, unfortunately in the eating disorder field, um, to delay treatment is very common because many behaviors are normalized in our culture. I always said that uh, if we compare the eating disorder to cancer, it's, it's like uh, no, one, um, no one will tell a doctor if the doctor says, oh, you have a cancer uh, stage one, no one will answer, okay, let me, let me get a stage four and I'll come back for treatment. <laughs> right. But unfortunately, that is um, always happening in the eating disorder field. We tell the people, oh, you know, these uh, behaviors are not normal. Let's start working on this. Uh, we, we identify either psychological, nutritional, or medical issues. And people usually say, no, no, this is going to pass. This is just temporarily. No, this is something um, I can deal with it myself. You know, and they delay and delay treatment until we get to that stage four. So one of the main missions we should have as professionals is to uh, help people to uh, identify and understand their symptoms so they can get uh, a treatment ASAP, you know, as soon as possible. Because uh, the, the, what we know by science is that the treatment is more effective before the disorder becomes chronic. Right. But as I said, remember, even with long-standing eating disorders, you can and do recover. Mm -hmm. 
So let's say like uh, if, um, if if I'm just sort of uh, getting a few kilos too much and I'm feeling guilty because I, I f after eating a full meal, I finished a whole box of uh, or Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And then afterwards, I'm thinking like, oh, my God, no, I feel so, uh, so po poorly. And, and so let, let's say that I was in that category of, of uh, so mild eating disorder. Nobody would recognize it. What would the treatment be for, for me? Like, where would you start and what is the process of the treatment? Okay, uh, first, um, people has to stop the eating disorder symptoms. So if it's restriction, if it's purging, if it's uh, binging, okay? So uh, the first step is to evaluate if people ha has any kind of risk for life or, or for function. So if you are in a medical state or psychiatric state that you are in, in high risk for any of them, then that is the first thing to treat. Mm -hmm. Once that is stable, uh, perhaps one of the most important considerations when selecting uh, psychotherapists is the type of therapy they provide. So different therapies work differently for different people. There is not one size fits all. And some may be more helpful than others, depending on the person and their stage of recovery. So um, as I said, reducing eating disorder behaviors is the first goal of treatment. And the following therapies currently have uh, that, that have the most evidence base uh, for effectiveness are, of course, uh, the first one is cognitive behavioral therapy and enhanced cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders. Uh, we have dialectical behavioral therapy. We have acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, so the most important thing is um, that while all these therapies are frequently used to treat individuals with eating disorders, they have varying levels of efficacy and research supporting uh, their use. So many professionals will recommend the use of evidence-based treatment. And um, that's that's what I always recommend my patients. And that's what I always recommend them to look for. Once the medical and uh, psychiatric risk are stable. And these, um, these uh, uh, therapies can be very effective to start treating and stopping the eating disorder symptoms or behaviors. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, when um, I'm not, I know we're talking about adults and the chef worlds, but if we have an eating disorder or if we su suspect an eating disorder in a ch child or in a uh, young adolescent or even a young adult, family-based treatment, also known as, as the Mousley method or the Mousley approach, is the, is the treatment of choice for adolescents, especially with anorexia and bulimia. And it's, uh, it's, um, it has been shown to be very, very effective and is uh, delivered by um, parents at home. And okay. VT uh, doesn't focus on the cause of eating disorders, uh, it's, uh, but instead places initial focus on refeeding and full weight restoration to promote recovery. And because as I, I have said before, because the sooner the better. And especially in a, in a body that is in growth and development is very, very important to restore weight and to promote a full, a full weight recovery as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess uh, like, like what you say, um, back to my example of uh, like, overindulging in ice cream or whatever or or having a second meal or overindulging in general so i guess it's it's easy to say like uh, no well first thing first thing we need to do is that for you to stop that and so i guess it's easier said than done because i guess person would already be aware that they're overindulging and they would feel like afterwards like oh no what did i do and they will probably start the day after <laughs> so so uh so uh, so how long would it take or or how much sort of uh, mental therapy would it uh, like minimum to to start to sort of change in that behavior right you cannot you cannot well what do you say first what, what would you say first like throw all your ice cream out don't buy ice cream would that like be the first and if you work in a kitchen well that's going to be difficult <laughs> you're in you're, you're surrounded by food all day long so uh yes uh i i understand um 
<laughs> Look, um, usually we can have very good results in the first six months of treatment. Right. This is a multidisciplinary approach. Mm. And as I said, first, we identify people who is in danger, who, people who is at high risk. Mm -hmm. And once we, we, um, we stabled, is a stabilized that, then the first step is to uh, uh, interrupt the eating disorder behaviors, the, to restore normal eating partners and returning to a healthy body weight for that person's individual shape and size, because it's different for everyone. You know, uh, people uh, can come in all sizes, in all shapes. So uh, we need to uh, help people to restore in what is uh, correct for them, okay? And then establish, have a, a structure in their, in their eating, normalized eating and nutritional rehabilitation. Um, and then start uh, teaching them one of the, stra uh, the strategies that we use in the evidence-based treatment is to teach people coping strategies. Um, they're going to unlearn uh, those strategies they are using that are not effective and they are going to learn new strategies, new coping skills, new coping strategies to, uh, um, to challenge all their e eating disorder related thoughts and behaviors. And um, um, one thing very important is that at the end of the treatment, to establish a prevention program or prevent relapse program. So these are like kind of the steps that we have to follow. Uh, always first saving life, then uh, interrupting uh, eating disorder behaviors, normalizing eating and nutritional rehabilitation, um, helping to promote social uh, integration again, and uh, to and and teaching the person to challenge all their eating disorder related thoughts and behaviors. So um, those are like the major um, uh, themes that people should uh, uh, work with their therapists and in, with their treatment team. Because mm -hmm. I always always uh, recommend that treatment should be done by the treatment team with multifaceted aspects, uh, which, um, which approach all the multifaceted uh, 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 aspects of the eating disorder, you know, with a physician, either an internal medicine doctor or a family doctor or a pediatrician or any spe specialist in the, in the medical field, the psychotherapist, the dietitian, the psychiatrist, any additional therapies as required, for example, if they need an art therapist or a yoga therapist or anyone who needs an, an and they have to work interdisciplinary to uh, support the patient and the family as much as they can. Yeah, I know you make a good point, actually, when you mentioned, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it could be um, for our audience that is listening, uh, might identify themselves in what you're saying, but uh, also within their own uh, family. Uh, you mentioned uh, adolescent or young, young adults or, 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 or children uh, that, you know, that this, this uh, also needs to be addressed. Where would, where would, uh, People start if they said to themselves now listening to you, like, yeah, I better better consult somebody. You you just start to talk to your own doctor, uh, your private doctor, or uh, where, where, where do you reach out? Where can you reach out for help? Yes, uh, I think that a uh, first step is go to your your PCP as uh, your primary care physician is and um, and. Um, one of the things that I always teach to PCPs is that you cannot um, see what you don't think. So one, uh, the, if you don't ask, you will never know. So um, a patient can go to their PCP and start talking about how they feel about food and how they feel and how they are relating to food. Usually the very common symptoms of eating disorders are emotional, behavioral, and physical. 
So if somebody um, has physical uh, symptoms, for example, um, changes in weight with no apparent um, uh, source, for example, there's not a medical condition, there's nothing that is doing that the weight goes up and down, or if they have gastrointestinal GI uh, symptoms are very common, for example, abdominal pain, cramps, constipation, reflux, or menstrual irregularities, or the absence of the menstrual periods, or um, uh, the brain. Or I I have a, a mantra. I always says that a uh, an undernourished brain can think, uh, um, feel, and uh, perceive different. So if, if if when you are very underweight or when you are not eating enough, when you're restricting, you may have difficulties concentrating, you may have dizziness, you may have fatigue, you may have a lack of energy, you can even have a syncope or going, uh, you know, um, uh, feeling um, that you're going to lose uh, your conscious. So all these physical symptoms that some can be very subtle and some can be very, very, very big. Uh, but uh, if you have a sleep problems, if you if you feel, uh, if you had cold intolerance and you feel cold all the time, those may be um symptoms that that can that can be a red flag and on the emotional and behavioral part if, as we have said the the high preoccupation with food with weight with calories with whatever i am eating or the refusal to eat certain foods or to feel uncomfortable around others especially around eating or if i am isolating or I find doing there's something that we call food riddles. That is it eating in in only in a particular way or 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 eating only particular food or, or food groups or um, chewing too much or don't allowing foods to touch you things like that. Sometimes I have patients that says that they identify their eating disorder because of this. They heard something about the food rituals and they said, oh, I'm doing this all the time, you know? So, or skipping meals or taking very, very small portions of food. If you, if you have a, a decrease in the portions of food uh, because you feel uncomfortable or as we said, feeling very guilty after eating. All these emotional and behavioral uh, symptoms uh, uh, plus this, the, the physical symptoms can make you think that probably there's something that you are struggling. If not with an eating disorder, probably with, uh, with a disorder eating that can, that can make you feel uh, physically and emotionally as bad as if you had a full-blown syndrome. So these are like red flags that we should be um, um, uh, taking care of and, um, and, and start working on them and, and looking for help. So uh, telling your PCP or your neutral dietitian or your, uh, even if you are already in psychotherapy, telling your psychotherapist about these uh, symptoms can, uh, can make them um, uh, guide you to the correct way to get uh, treatment team for the eating disorder. So first thing is to be diagnosed. And, 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 and as I said at the beginning, if you don't ask, you will never know. So if, if your PCP doesn't ask you, please go and, and tell them what you are, what you are um, going through so they can uh, guide you correctly with the correct person and the correct uh, area of your, in your hometown. How about uh, like a self-helping? But before that, self-helping. But like I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, there's a lot of business in uh, proposing different diets and like a carb-free, uh, no, like full car, uh, yeah, carb-free, all-protein diet. I can't remember the name of it. I'm not an expert, but but there are all sort of, of programs for diet and, and Weight Watchers, and they promise you uh, uh, you like sign up with us and uh, you will lose so many and so much weight, and there's before and after picture of people and 
what is your take on 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 these sort of diets? Are are they uh, are, are they recommended? Can you self help yourself through like taking those diets? Or do they work really or like? Um, that's a very interesting question, Ragnar. Mm -hmm. um, a central mechanism for the development of an eating disorder is to restrict food. Okay. Mm -hmm. And most diets that are more, most fat diets in the industry are restrictive. Mm. So what I can tell you is that any, any di diet or any, any, yeah, any type of uh, suggestions about how to eat that restricts food for you can be dangerous. Mm. Okay. And, and why I say for you, because is different for every person. Probably what I eat is not enough for you or maybe too much for you. So it's uh, it will depend on each person. I think that people has to eat according to their, uh, we need to teach them about their society and hunger cues so they can start eating in a more intuitive way, in a more uh, giving their body what they need and what is a uh, perfect for the body instead of being um, guided by um, rules and I, I I always uh tell my my patients that the more rules you have around food the mm. more problem you may have That's so, funny. so yeah, I, I've heard that before and because I, there's a phrase I loved from from uh, somebody I, I saw on on, uh, on YouTube I guess who said you you can eat everything you want uh, as long as you can cook it yourself basically <laughs> of course you have to have it in quantity uh, relative quantities but basically what he was saying is that eat eat natural eat natural food and and just keep it in good balance uh, avoid processed food was basically what the person was saying uh, and so it's back to like uh, I know in America often uh, they take French for for an example like how can they eat all this chocolate and still stay, stay slim? Well, they are not binging the chocolate. They are they are. It's a part of a diet. Uh, it's a part of a diet. As a as a part of a balanced diet. I wanted to say. Yes. Yes. I I always um ask my patients to reject the diet mentality. You know um all this false hope of uh, losing weight quickly, easily. And we know by science that that is not permanent and that 95% um, or more of the people who goes into these uh, fat diets will get back their weight in less than two years. And um, and the only the only thing that they can, and the only thing that when we get into restricted diets, what we get is we can develop eating disorders, but also we can get into higher weights. You know, it's a very good way, way to uh, gain weight, okay? Mm -hmm. And most of us, most of, most of all, is the best way to distort your relation with food and your body. Mm -hmm. And that can be forever, that can be for life. And that is very, very important to know when you start, when you do not honor your hunger, when you are not in peace with food, um, getting to, into restricted diets can 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 send you to that path, you know, to have a very very bad relationship with food and your body, and and it's not fair. I mean, um, you can have a very good life, and 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 that's that's one of the main uh, goals to to have a life that is worth living. You know, so so um, um, a very good advice that I would like to give people is reject the diet mentality and honor your hunger as uh, many of the mantras we have in this field, make peace with food. And, um, honor and your I know hunger. it's hard. I, I know I, it's hard. <laughs> I like what you said, uh, to be at peace with food. I think that, that, that could be a, a nice title for this uh, podcast. <laughs> yes i know uh that is a big <laughs> and that um it uh, was developed by um by uh evelyn tribal and on um uh, um, other uh, other authors about intuitive eating no you know and uh yeah. i think that is very very important now uh, when you finally um stop um classifying food as if it's forbidden or not um the experience you can get from food is 
is amazing. I mean, Absolutely. because food is food, you know, food is food, and you can. Uh, what pleasure. can I tell you? <laughs> uh, so, so brain and body. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, and uh, eating without guilt, eating um, just to feel good, to to feel healthy, to feel happy. I think that is uh, something everyone should experience. Wonderful. Eva, thank you very much for that. And, uh, and you know, uh, uh, we will put some resources for people that want to know more. Uh, if there is a certain uh, self-help that, uh, that uh, they could do, uh, we will put some resources from you on the, uh, on the podcast uh, page where people have links to different resources. They can read more and to understand more of the mechanism. So uh, educate yourself. And, and I guess, uh, what, as you say, Eva, uh, start to be a, uh, honor your hunger and be at peace with food as, as a good starting point get away from uh, the diet mentality and and if you feel that uh, you do have a, a problem is to seek help sooner than later asap with your uh, local doctor and and uh, and to see what actions need to be taken immediately so i think uh, would that sum it up yeah, great, great. You did a great sum up. And uh, yes, those are some of the principles of intuitive eating. And uh, I really work with that and I love it and uh, I recommend it. So uh, definitely um, um, everybody has the, the, everybody should have the, the opportunity to have a good life and to, to have a life worth living. And um and making all this, uh, making all this that uh, you know, rejecting the diet mentality, uh, making uh, peace with food, honoring your hunger, yours. Uh, it's it's a great way to start. And thank you, Ragnar, for this invitation. I feel very privileged to be here today. I love it, and I will give you all the the links you need for your audience, so everyone can. Uh, start a life worth living thank you eva the privilege is, is mine the honor is ours and, and we thank you very much for sharing this very important theme and and uh, and i guess uh, very relevant uh, uh, to our profession as you mentioned it, it uh, touches more than half of the, uh, the the people working in the profession so thank you very much again eva and uh, and maybe we'll see you again for for more for some more input so uh, so uh, i want to thank you again thank you oh my pleasure thanks to you so thank you everyone for listening to uh, World on a Plate. We, we were with uh, Eva Trujillo uh, talking about uh, uh, um, uh, what, what, now I lost my I, know I lost it out of my words about uh, eating disorders. Jesus Christ. And so it's getting late in the day. Sorry, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, for following our podcast. Uh, we will put some more links and resources on our web uh, website so you can follow uh, further. But please uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to our podcast and, and uh, put a liking star if you if you enjoyed the show. Follow us for, for later episodes. Uh, special thanks to our great partners, uh, Nestle Professional and Electrolux uh, Food Foundation. Uh, that uh, with all this would not be possible. And uh, so I want to say all to you, uh, honor your hunger and uh, be at peace with food and uh, speak to you, uh, hear from you all next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.